and um, I had a lot of challenges there. I weren't rich by any means at all, and uh, <laughs> so we had to face a lot of challenges. Moved to New York, and uh, when I was 10, more challenges, more and more challenges. But one of the biggest choices I made about a challenge that I was going to do is I didn't want to be mediocre or normal, right? I wanted to ensure that I separate myself from the crowd because the kids I was hanging out with in high school, they wanted to be normal. And I realized there's a choice I have to make. Okay, what's more important, being one of the cool, popular kids or setting myself up for success and making that unpopular choice, that unpopular challenge of not trying to be cool or popular in high school, but actually handle business. So I made that choice, but I'm telling you, I barely got out of there, okay? Still barely got out of there. So I was in the New York City public school system, and fortunately, mom noticed it wasn't doing what it was supposed to do. I was on pace to be a graduate, but that was about it. There was no plan. I didn't know anything. So mom kicked me out, sent me to an all-boys military school in Virginia, in the middle of nowhere in Virginia. And it was culture shock. I hated life. I hated it. I really hated it. I really, really hated it. It was my senior year at high school. I was supposed to be hanging out with my friends in New York and, you know, just take over the school as seniors, but I couldn't do that anymore. I'm at a strange school, strange people, new faces. So that was a huge challenge, and I did it. And it turns out that was a turning point in my life, right? So I'm glad I made the choice of not purposely getting kicked out of that school, I'm trying to, you know, rebel from mom's decision to send me there. I probably would have been dead if I did that choice. So glad I didn't get kicked out, right? So I did that, ended up going to college. So I, I graduated from the Citadel in 2001 and uh, University of Oklahoma in 2004 with a master's degree and I got my doctorate in 2012 at University of Phoenix. So just let you guys know that those choices you make, those decisions you make, even at your age right now, make a huge impact. For example, when I was growing up in Jamaica, first time I ever saw an airplane take off up close at the airport, I was done, man. I was in love with airplanes. I was like, man, that's the coolest thing I've ever, ever seen in my life. So I was probably about seven, eight years old. Every Christmas, every birthday, my gift request was something to do with airplanes. So I loved them, loved them, loved them. And that choice I made back then, I had no idea would influence my life. So. Yeah, so I went to college, did Air Force ROTC, and because I did okay, they asked me, hey, what do you want to do in the Air Force? That's like asking a fish to use swim. Like, I want to fly on airplanes, man. <laughs> I want to do something with airplanes. So the last 14 years in the Air Force, before I came here to Colorado Springs, I've been getting paid pretty well to fly around in a $330 million airplane. And so when you go to work and do something that you love, life is good. And you can't get to that point unless you actually make those tough choices growing up, face those challenges, separate yourself. So with that, just uh, letting you know that goes in line with the theme about facing challenges and making choices. So keep that in mind. That decision I made when I was seven actually guided my whole life. And I had to jump through a whole lot of challenges on the way. Challenges that the Air Force presented, You've got to be in college to be an Air Force officer, so that was a challenge. I had to graduate college. So I started, hey, what's it take for me to fly an airplane in the Air Force? I just backed it up, found out all the hoops, hurdles I had to get through, all those challenges to get there, and I got there, right, based on the decision I made when I was seven. So with that, my job is to tell you guys all about an action plan. Anybody ever make an action plan before? Because I really didn't know that that's what I was starting when I was seven, when I said, I'm gonna do something with airplanes, right? I didn't even know that was kinda of like making an action plan. So now you guys are hearing about it up front. So think about what you wanna be, your ultimate career goal, what you wanna be, and then you just gotta peel back the onion going backwards, figure out all the steps that will take you to get there. That's pretty much an action plan. So you guys got one of these. So we'll just go over it real quick. You're not going to fill it out until the end of the last session. So be sure to fill in all your contact info because we're going to have to be able to contact you to follow up to see where you are in the action plan. 
a couple weeks after the summit. All right, so the key to an action plan, have you guys ever heard of SMART? And it even tells you what it means, right? So your goal or your plan needs to be specific. So specific like, I want to fly on a really cool airplane for a living. It's got to be specific. So you can't say, I want to be rich. That's not specific enough, right? There's tons of things you can be. So be specific. Uh, you want it to be measurable. How can you measure whether you're accomplishing your goal or if you need to do more to meet your goal, right? So how I was able to measure my goal was, am I meeting all the requirements? Do I have my eyesight? Am, am I meeting the physical fitness requirements that the Air Force will need for me to do this goal? Is it achievable, right? So like I said, you're going backwards. So you guys should be thinking maybe the next year or six months, what you need to be doing to meet that, to make that goal achievable, all right? So when I was seven, or when I got to New York to high school, the next step in order for me to achieve that goal is get into college. Because you gotta have a college degree to be a military officer. Only military officers get to fly on airplanes. So, so you gotta peel back to see, hey, what do I need to do in the next six months to a year to make me this achievable goal? Is it relevant? Make sure your goal for your action plan is relevant, meaning it has to mean something to you. Because if it doesn't mean much to you, you're not going to put out the effort. So working on airplanes meant the world to me. I was willing to do anything it took to get that job. So make sure your goal is relevant. Make sure it's something that means something to you, and it will give you that drive to pursue. And I had to jump through all kind of hoops, hurdles, and um, crawling through mud and doing all the stuff the military made me do before I could even go to training, right? So if it's relevant, you'll do the work to get there. And time-based. So when you're doing your action plan, make sure you can give yourself a timeline to see how you're doing for those next few steps you need to do. All right? So that's what you guys are going to fill out at the end of the workshop at about 3.30 in the third session. So. Listen to the info you guys are going to be getting from all these sessions. Marinate on it, think about it, do whatever you do, meditate, and then you should be able to act, execute your action plan at that point. Any questions? No questions? Yes, ma'am. What kind of plan do you want? Uh, AWACS. I'm a senior weapons director on the AWACS, Airborne Warning and Control System. Yep. So, all right, so with that, I'm going to turn the session over. Ms. Mary Malia. She is the Executive Director at Inside Out Youth Services. So with further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you everybody for being here today. Um, I'm actually just going to introduce some very special individuals who are here to talk about life experience, growing up, being LGBTIQ, they're going to uh, educate you about some things. They're going to share some of their personal story with you. Now, Inside Out Youth Services is an organization that's based here in Colorado Springs. It was founded 25 years ago when some people who were working for the county of El Paso realized that LGBTIQ youth represented a disproportionate amount of youth that were involved in the criminal justice system. And somebody who was that she was an out lesbian decided she was going to do something to help LGBTIQ kids. And what we know today is LGBTIQ youth represent a disproportionate number of homeless youth in this country. That's one of the important things that Inside Out does is we provide a safe space for our youth to come to hang out, to learn, to grow, to evolve, to become their best selves. And in that, you know, we know 40% of homeless youth are LGBTIQ. But we're only 5% of the whole population. That's what disproportionate means. It means, whoa, there's a whole lot more of you in this category than you would expect because you're not really that much of the population. And why does it happen? It happens for lots of different reasons. But one of the things we want to do today is by educating you is to help you become, if this if LGBTIQ represents you, get more comfortable with who you are, and to know that there's supports and there's information and there's people out here in this community who care about you and created a safe space and a place for you to go. And at the same time, for you to meet other young people who are living their lives 
as openly as they know how, in ways that they know how, who are growing and coming out and in embracing that whole questioning process about who they are, and, and then making a claim about who they are in the world. So uh, we're going to start by just doing an exercise, which we do at Inside Out when we um, have uh, activities with our youth. We just call it check-in. And in check-in, you share your first name, your, your age, your pronouns, and then usually we have a question or two that we ask youth to um, think about and answer. But today we're going to keep it really simple, and we're just going to ask you to tell us where you came from today. So um, we're going to start up here so you have this living example with, with the, this great crew of people. And um, we'll start right here with... Hi, I'm, I'm Doe. Uh, I'm 18, and uh, they come from today. Oh, and I'm from the uh, My name is Jack, 18 years of age, pronouns of the male flavor, and I also come from uh, Southern Springs. This is cute. I guess. <laughs> Anyways, um, my name is Alex. I go by male pronouns. I am 16 and I come from the Springs. Uh, my name is Devin. I'm turning 17 tomorrow. And <laughs> uh, you can use any pronouns with me. They, them, is preferred. And I was born in the Springs. My name is Jeff. <laughs> I'm 18 new pronouns. Do you, do you prefer to be called she, or they, or he? Called she. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Savannah, she, and I'm 16, I'm from Florida. Alright, can we grab that, that table right there? So we've got... Oh, and I'm 14. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I'm Where did you come from today? Where, where are you like living today? Okay, so we'll keep it simple and short. Thank you. 
Um, I'm Calvin. I come from Colorado. And uh, I'm 17. And I prefer to be called E. I'm Patrick. I'm 17. I come from Fountain. And I prefer to be called E. I'm Savon. I'm 18. I prefer to be called E. Speak up so we can hear you over here. I'm Simon, I'm 18, and I'm from um, no. Thank you. I'm 15. I prefer he. And my name is Duche. I'm Dordia. I'm from Jamaica. I'm 40 years old. I'm a prefer she pronoun. And this is my daughter, Dana. She's 8 years old. She's from Colorado, and she's from uh, she, she pronoun. My name is Ricardo, my first is he, and I'm 18 years old, and I'm from the Springs. Uh, my name is Chris, 17 year old male, and I'm from Colorado. I'm Cassasia, I'm the first chief pronoun, I'm 16. I'm from Fountain, and I'm for male pronouns. Hi, Michael. I think I'm 16. I'm from Fountain. I prefer she. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Are we interview? Hey, guys, sitting now. We got two chairs up here. <laughs> <laughs> got some extra chairs. Okay. Extra chairs. <laughs>
is a, is a scientific term that means sex based on what's between your legs. So if you're born with female genitalia, you're female. If you're born with male, you're male. If you're intersex, the doctor decides. But So cisgender here and then um, heterosexual is the straight world. Right? That it's always a male and a female is going to be together and have a relationship. So heteronormative says that's what's normal. And, and where the world is changing and we're moving away from a heteronormative world. You basically assume everyone around you is straight and born as the gender they were. Yeah. I have pansexual, I'm not really sure. Pansexual is uh, is you were sexually attracted to all genders. So again, like they were saying earlier, um, it's more it's not so much of a sex based thing, but more of an emotional based thing. Polyamory. 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 Oh no. Okay, so polyamory is uh, where you date. Where uh, somebody somebody might be dating multiple people at a time, consensually. So, yeah, consensually. Um, so while you might, so while most relationships are one on one, which would be known as monogamy, um, one person might be dating um, someone else as well. And as long as everyone involved knows about it and is okay with that, then it is considered polyamory and is not cheating. However, if you were to date somebody and not tell any of those, then it would still be cheating as as a normal relationship. Some kind of surgery to 
aligned with the parents' decision, and then they're they're forced to stick with that decision. Like, so when they're born, they don't have anything. They could have both or a mix of the two. And it can also be hormone based. Like they might have um, medically female the genitalia, but produce uh, testosterone. It's more if you're just born that way. Body no, so like, to to oh, it's not okay for the parent to kill. You should never be there. Yeah, I read that more often than not, uh, the child doesn't seem to be identified with the gender that children are going to be So it's, it's that idea of parents that pick the gender because that's sort of where, where things were for many, many years and that is evolving now and changing. As we're talking about it more and intersex people are, they're coming out and identifying and saying, my parents assigned me to be a female, but I'm male. That's who I am. And so it's that difference of letting the child define who they are. Um, which in uh, most of our culture, certainly in the United States, is not so. In Native American culture, that's very so. That's, that's actually how they relate to the children. Next. Okay. Oh, I got monogamy, which is a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Yep. Okay, let's do, let's do one right. And then let's, yeah. Okay. Monogamy and child. Very sexual. Asexual. Gray asexual. So gray asexual. So we went over asexual earlier, which is where you're not sexually attracted to anybody. Gray asexual, or well, well, it's gray asexual, but it can apply to any form of sexuality. So for example, gray asexual would be um, gray gray asexual, but every now and then there's like that one person who, who, you, like, who you might be sexually attracted to, just like that that one person, or. Um, or as another example, if you're heterosexual, like a heterosexual male, then, then for the most part you're always attracted to the females, but there might be that one guy. But that is called heteroflexible. Yeah, but it, it goes under that umbrella. Okay. And we don't, we don't want to learn a lot about cat you. And we're going to have a question period at the end. So if you have anything that could, that's just, if you're not understanding, we can explain it better. No, um, All right. do the uh, diagram, yeah. and then do the Okay, there's a ball. So we're, yeah, we're going to move on to the next Okay, so I passed out earlier a handout that looks either something like this or has a unicorn on it, because we didn't print enough of these. My bad. Um, <laughs> the, the general concept is the same. So this, this is a human being, and we're going to talk about how the mess of terms we gave you applies to an actual person. So when a person is born, a doctor picks them up, looks at them, and says, oh, they have this between their legs, so they're a boy, they're a girl, they're intersex. That is a person's biological sex. It's what's between their legs, um, and it's what you're identified as when you're, or you're assigned as when you're born. So next is gender expression, which is what you wear, how you present yourself, your mannerisms, that kind of thing. And that can be masculine, which is like flannel, uh, uh, stereotypically short hair, um, these boots, for example, are your loving. Um, feminine might be dresses, uh, blouses, long hair. Long hair. And um, there can be even people who uh, can mix the two styles or can dress as something else entirely, and that's totally cool. And neither of these two things, your biological sex or your gender expression, necessarily have to do with your gender identity, which is what's between your ears as opposed to between your legs. It's who you, who you know you are as a person, who you identify as for your gender. For example, somebody who is assigned female at birth, uh, who identifies as male, we call them a trans male, a transgender male. And somebody who is assigned female at birth, who identifies as female, we call them a cisgender female, because those two things align. And then there are also people who identify as neither male or female, and those are referred to as non-binary people, because they don't fall into the binary of the two genders. And then there are some people who um, don't identify as any gender, and we call them agender. And there are people who identify as both genders, and we call them bigender. And 
If you know your Greek term, it's really good. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot to throw at you right now, yeah. but but again, we're gonna we're gonna have a question session so you can be more clear on things. But the the moral of the story is your gender identity is the most important thing that has to do with your gender. It doesn't matter what you wear. It doesn't matter what you have between your legs. What's in between your ears, what's in your head, who you know you are, is the most important thing. And that's where your pronouns come from. So if you identify as female, you use she. So next we're going to move to the uh, sexual romantic uh, attractions. So romantic attraction is your, who you're emotionally attracted to. So if, if you're like Cassie, we have an, emo an emotional bond, then I am romantically attracted to her. As opposed to sexual attraction, which is more of a physical bond. And these things can coexist, so you can be romantically attracted to females and sexually attracted to females, or romantically attracted to males but sexually attracted to females, or combinations. So it's feelings versus sex. Yes. It's who you want to like share your life with versus who you want to share your bed with. Who you want to be seen in the streets with, but, uh, <laughs> rather than being seen in the sheets with. <laughs> And a person can have a sexual attraction to somebody and not a romantic attraction, or a romantic attraction and not a sexual attraction. And these can be, as with roots, if you've ever learned about those, it's pansexual you can use for panromantic. So you're romantically attracted to them. Just stop right here and ask some questions, right specifically about yep. that. Yep. Right in.
but and and for and for, and for everybody it's different. Um, some people it's it's a lot more even of a mix, but for me it's I'm almost always identifying as masculine. Basically, everyone they're told you have to be male or female, or you have to be masculine or feminine, and that's not always how it is. Sometimes everyone has a little bit of both, or they feel that sometimes. Or like for me, I identify as a guy. And sometimes, you know what, whatever. I want to put on a dress and I want to feel pretty, but I still use male pronouns because I'm a guy. <laughs> Could you explain the concept of binding? Oh, uh, binding is called chest binding. And basically, <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so there are a lot of different ways to bind your chest, and it is for a uh, female assigned at birth people to uh, make their chest look flat and masculine. Um, and this can be done with a um, few negative ways is, um, is ace bandage and duct tape. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's it awful. It you can warp ribs. and break your ribs and it's just awful. Okay. And then the most safe way is uh, to buy a compression vest and um, they um, distribute uh, pressure evenly throughout your entire body, or if you have a tri top, with meaning like cuts off here, um, just here. Um, and it will um, make yourself flat, flatter than beautiful. And they're, um, yeah, but you can't wear them for more than eight hours, which a lot of people do. Um, accident. <laughs> um, um, and it's it's just a way for someone to feel more comfortable in the skin that they were born in. And some people all, like buy yeah. this a lot. Hi, Matt. Um, there's very different types of ones, that, and there's actually a campaign to actually start selling them in stores like publicly, so people don't have to like search the internet and be all like secretive about it. And basically binding, it's, there's different types, and most of the time people don't know really how, know how to because they don't get the right education on like how to bind, and examples in media always use these binding and so that's really bad. Really and like, you can get like, um, Velcro, like hooks, or ones that you just slip over and- or zipper. Zipper, and then you can make swimming ones, and then it's just, it's, it's neat how it works, but then like, there's a lot of research you have to do into it, so you don't do it and like hurt yourself. Yeah. Yeah. For those of you who are like really in your identity, you often like experience people who discredit you because of that. Like you were assigned as female, and then <coughs> on a certain day when you feel female, people are like, oh, like they try and like you were never really yes. Um, it's common, really, like. Why were you pretending to be something you're not? Or why is it that you do this? Or things like that. And it is more, well, you're just female, also. Why are you pretending to be a man? Yeah, and, and a lot of people who don't, um, and parents are, um, can have the worst effect in this manner. Uh, like, people who are not so understanding about it, um, like if there's a um, female assigned at birth person who identifies as male. There, and say their parents don't um, understand it and, and probably don't accept that because of it, um, they, they, they won't use their preferred pronouns or they'll, um, and they'll, they'll usually use their um, birth name because most trans people change their name to something of the opposite gender. And so they won't respect their, their chosen name or their chosen gender or anything like that. And it, and it can cause a lot of um, like mental and emotional issues in that respect as well because um, they're, they're not being accepted for who they are by someone as close as their parents. <clears throat> yeah. Um, also, like, what are some things like challenges or just things that bother you on a day to day basis that you experience? Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, well um, basically, dysphoria and body dysphoria is one of the largest things. And dysphoria basically means. A uh, hatred of life and body dysphoria is a hatred of your body. Like, why couldn't I just be born with what I wanted? And why did this have to happen to me? Kind of thing. And uh, 
Um, like, for me, it's like I have a kind of feminine voice. Um, and sometimes it really bugs me. Um, but, um, and if my parents were accepting, which they're not, um, I could go on to testosterone, um, hormone, re hormone replacement therapy, and get testosterone in my body, and then I get a bigger voice. Um, but I can't, and that really frustrates me, like, every day. And also just ignorance of people. Most Not just ignorance, but like arrogance. Yeah. And it affects you most in families. Yeah. Like family members who say, I'll never accept you. Or You'll always be my little girl. Like, or, no! <laughs> or I'm gonna get a beard. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, no matter what happens, I'll never call you male pronouns, they'll always be female. And another big problem for trans people is what's called misgendering. So when, when somebody looks at somebody else, they tend to put a lot of face value on what biological sex they look like, as opposed to what they might identify as. So a really good way to avoid this is to always refer to people you don't know as they, them. Uh, even, even if they have long hair, even if they're wearing a dress, because you never really know how they identify unless you ask them their pronoun. And, um, so it may seem like an intrusive thing to do or a weird thing to do. A lot of people don't mind being asked their pronoun because it shows them that you care how they identify, you care about who they are, and it avoids any misgendering, which is really to avoid that. You can also use they, them, like they yeah. exist because it's gender neutral instead of having to ask. Yeah. Did you say that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you any, if you ask anyone like that their pronouns, I guarantee you it's gonna make their day. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then other people who like 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 heteronormative people who like don't think of anyone as other than what they appear or anything like that. Um, a lot of times they, they they might take offense to that, um, but that's mostly due to just lack of knowledge, not anything else. Arrogance, not ignorance. Yeah. Also, another big thing is churches. <laughs> like for me, I grew up in a church, uh, in a Baptist church, um, and I was going there since I was born. And um, <laughs> I came out as trans, as a trans guy, and <laughs> um, I was working there, and they fired me. Um, I hadn't been going there anyway, so I was like, now I don't have to go there at all. Peace. <laughs> But, um, just, like, I remember, like, how it was before I came out, and everyone was, like, so, like, inviting. I got, like, 50 million highs when I walked in the door, and, like, everyone knew my name and all that kind of stuff. And then, like, I go back a few weeks after I come out, and no one looks at me. And I'm just kind of, like, what? And so, like, I go downstairs, and they, like, use my, um, birth name, and I, I, I don't respond to it anymore, really, um, and, and it's really funny, and now, next time I go there, I'm just gonna be, like, flaming, I'm just like, <laughs> um, I'm ready, <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
affect you immediately? Like, if you're not their doctor, you don't need to know about their biological. Basically, habits. would you ask a straight cis person what is in their pants? It's like it's like asking. You ask a trans person, have you had the surgery? It's like asking some random dude, are you circumcised? Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, so um, I think we're just going to take a break on the questions. So if you've got questions, hold them. We're write them down. Back the questions. And they're going to share their stories. Um, you know, and uh, I'll, I'll just keep an eye on my watch. We'll give you about, each about five minutes. So then that leaves us about 20 minutes. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> story time. So I'm I'm No, um, and I live here. And my my parents, like, they've always been focused on teaching me to be respectful of people, to be compassionate, no matter who you're dealing with. And so in seventh grade, I started to question whether or not I was attracted to only boys. I was like, ooh, that girl. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> and so I fully identified as gay in eighth grade. And then I had to live in about a year and a half of terror because both my parents are, are pretty religious, uh, traditional Christian people. And um, I was really worried about what they might say, what they might do if I came out to them. Um, and when I finally did, it was to my mom in a Tokyo Joe's. So, <laughs> location, 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 I guess. But um, I'm, I'm really, really fortunate because everyone I've come out to has been really supportive of me and told me, we love you for who you are. And as long as you're in a healthy relationship, we don't care who it's with. And for a lot of people, that doesn't happen, unfortunately. So I've always been really grateful that I've been so lucky. And then uh, this, this year-ish, like, I've, I've been really confused about my gender, and I can already tell 2016 is going to be the year of uncertainty with my gender for me, because I've, I've identified as a, a cis female, which means I was assigned female at birth and I identified as female for most of my life, but lately I've been like, what is gender even? <laughs> what am I? And so today I'm feeling really disconnected from that whole thing, that's why I'm today going by beta pronouns. And I grew up in half the time. I grew up in a very religious household. They were all very Christian, and my half, that half of the family was, and three fourths of my other half of the family was also very religious, very unaccepting religious. And so my entire life, I kind of questioned, but I kind of pushed away the thought that I was anything but straight cis, and it was like this can't be. And in eighth grade, a friend of mine came out as gay, and I was like, you know what, this is bisexual, and so I was like, hey guys, what's up? And, uh, that was pretty accepting when my friends were like, why didn't you tell me sooner? And it was ridiculous, and got mad. So, <laughs> and so uh, that was my first coming out story with that school, and like, four people, maybe. And, uh, then later on, my entire life, like, since then, it was like, do I like boys? Do I like girls? Do I like anyone? And uh, it was, I still don't know this question, you know, pansexual. And so, and then around sophomore year, I was like, hey, I kind of don't always feel like a woman. So what happens with this? What do I do with this, you know? And so I was kind of talking to my friends and, a lot of reactions of what I got were things like, really, or I don't know, you, or like that kind of thing. It was kind of, no one believed me. And uh, then I started coming out to my uh, sister. I guess that was freshman year. I came out to her in a sushi place <laughs> while my stepdad was in the bathroom. And she was like, <laughs> <laughs> And so, uh, and then I started going to Inside Out, and uh, my mom woke up and she was like, are you transgender? She was like all shocked and she was like worried about me and we were like driving to the store or something. And I'm like, nah, mom, I'm just 
I'm what they call pansexual, and super fluid, and I had to talk with her. She was really accepting, except for the fact that she was mostly like, you'll always be my little girl, and I'll never be able to call you my male pronoun, so don't even like, try. Kind of and so that was kind of the first experience I got with coming out with gender. And I still haven't come out to a lot of my friends or to talk to them about it. It's still kind of a wishy-washy thing. They're like, Devin, what are you? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and so I, my entire life was, I don't know, because it's either this or that, or I'm unsure, or I'm confused, or I guess confused wouldn't be the right word. I was never set something. I was always something or both or always, and I always wished I would just something, I would just be straight, or I would just be gay, or I would just be male, or I would just be female, it was never that way to and so, so, um, I, like, I, I was raised, like, you know, respect everybody for who they are and everything, and, like, I've, I've always been very accepting of, of, of gay people and just any, and anything, just anything anyone was, really, um, and it wasn't until my freshman year that I even, like, the thought even occurred to me at all that I could have possibly been anything other than straight. Um, and it was, I was, I was on the bus, or there was this guy who sits behind me on the bus, um, and so we would talk every day, and then about two or three months into school, um, he asked me out. And I was like, sorry, no, nah, I'm, I'm not gay, I don't, I don't I'm sorry. Um, and so I said no, and then that, that was on a Monday. And so I went home, and then like every day that week, I kind of like thought about it, and thought about it, like like what like what if I just said yes? Would it have really been so bad? I mean, like I mean, I could at least like try it just so I could like know. So by the end of the week, like all those thoughts kind of sat and sank in. Um, and so that Friday, when he would when he got on the bus, I told him to sit next to me, and I, I told him that I had changed my answer, um, which was pretty. So he I dated him for about three weeks before I realized that men are jerks. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, and like, so while that relationship itself wasn't particularly awesome, uh, it did kind of like open my eyes to a whole new world. Um, and I started like, I started, I started like, you know, thinking a little differently and like, and, and seeing the world a, a little differently. And, um, and so it, it, it wasn't, it, it took me like a total of like two weeks to feel comfortable enough with myself um, before I started coming out to like close friends and then they all, all had positive responses so I started coming out to more people and then it, it was like a month before I was out to absolutely everybody but my parents. Um, and then it wasn't until like two and a half years after that, yeah last July actually, so like yeah two and a half, three and a half years after that, yeah okay, I don't know how he knows that but I don't know that. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so it wasn't until like two and a half, three and a half years after that until I decided to come out to my mother. Because like at first I didn't really want to tell her. Um, and then a little bit later I was kind of just like, like finding excuses not to or, um, and then after a while it was just because it like never came up in conversation until eventually like I was just like, I, I, I just, I need to come out to her or whatever. And, and even though someone like me, like I've never really had a lot of backl or backlash um, with any, like, I've never really had a lot of negative responses with coming out or, like, I, no one really, like, disapproved or anything for me, but even so, I still had, like, a really hard time coming out to my mother, because, um, like, from the moment I decided to, like, I'm going to do it, it still took me another week and a half to actually do it, um, so for someone like me who does not have that struggle and it was that difficult, it, it's, it kind of puts it in perspective for me, at least, as to how hard it must be for people who know their parents aren't so accepting and know that they won't be so accepted or, or mm -hmm. like seriously fear that they won't be. And, and, uh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, see, and um, my sister came out as bisexual years before I even um, figured out that I was um, gay, well, pansexual. Uh, so like, she came out as gay sometime in my middle school years, I don't like early middle school. Um, and then it wasn't until freshman year when I started dating that guy. Um, and then even though like my parents had a good reaction, like there wasn't—I I don't know anyone in my family who disapproved of my sister being gay. 
Um, and even with that knowledge, I, it still took me the two and a half years and in the week and a half to come out to my mother, even though I already knew she'd be okay with it because she was okay with my sister. So it's, it's, it's difficult even if there's not a lot of obstacles. And yeah. Okay, so I grew up in a very Christian household. Uh, um, and um, not just household, entire family. Ha! All six aunts and uncles on mom's side and my own uncle on my dad's side. Ha! That was scary. Um, and so I remember just being like this kind of tomboy girl, whatever. I had long hair, went down to like the middle of my back. Um, and um, I was just kind of like, whatever, I don't even care. Like, I just dressed how I wanted to dress, and like, I still do. Um, but um, I remember um, this magical thing called Tumblr. <laughs> um, is where I actually found out what transgender is. Um, and I read it, and I was like, that me. That me. <laughs> and, um, I was like so confused because like, for years, I have always been like going through like, ages of like, I really want to be a guy. Oh, but I can't be, because that's not possible. Whatever. Ha ha ha. Um, but now, like, I could. I could, like, be a guy and actually be happy. And it was mind-blowing and amazing. And, um, so, <laughs> my sister found out. And she told me that the devil was working inside of me. Ha. <laughs> and uh, she just yelled at me a lot. And so I was just like, yeah, well, whatever, I'm happy. <laughs> so I just, like, just started her or whatever. Um, and I kept coming up to my friends, and, um, yeah, there were points where I was just like, do I really want this, or, like, what, what's going on? And then I was just like, nope, I'm a guy. Um, <laughs> and I had a lot of weird, like, responses to me coming out. Like, one of my friends who has two moms, like, I thought she'd be fine with it, but she was like, no. I was like, what do you mean, no? <laughs> like, I just told you I'm a guy, and you say no. That's not how this works. <laughs> and, um, just like other things of, like, being fetishized, which is gross. Um, and, um, like, just feeling awkward around my friends sometimes, and I got a lot of new friends, and actually they were pretty much all my old friends and that I abandoned because of the past relationship um, that was abusive. Um, <laughs> and so like all of these people that I hung out with were all queer, and I was like, awesome! <laughs> um, and um, so I finally came out to my mom, no, I came out to my dad, on 9-11. Um, oh. Uh, oh. Thank you. <laughs> in 9-11, in my therapy office. Um, and I was crying my eyes out and stuff, and he was just like, whatever, I don't care. And, I mean, he still doesn't support me. He doesn't use my name or pronouns or anything. But he was just kind of like, here you do you. And then um, I came out to my mom on the 19th of that month. And 9-19. And... Uh, she was just kind of like, I was like, um, I, I'm transgender. And she was like, what is that? And I'm like, you watched it on TV. Like, you literally just, like, watched it on TV that night before. It was really funny. Because I was just like, what? <laughs> I was so scared. Um, but she was just kind of like, I don't, I don't know. I'll look into it. And of course she doesn't. <laughs> um, but... I mean, it hasn't all been bad because I found um, uh, the GSTA at Palmer High School, um, which uh, that way over there is the president, and I'm going to be the president next year. He's um, doing a great job. Um, also, I found Inside Out. 
and um, Inside Out has really been a family for me. Um, I've been going for a little, almost a year now, and um, it's been amazing, and I love it there. It's so inviting, and I just, it's definitely something that I wouldn't have, like, been able to be as confident as I am now without, um, because of just other things in my life, such as my illness, which impacts a lot of queer people, a lot, um, and, um, I would have never found a label or whatever that suits me so well. Um, I go by gray, a plesiosexual, panromantic, polyamorous, trans man. <laughs> Did you get that? So, um, like, it's just me, like, being super open-minded, and, like, now I have all of these friends and stuff, and I have, I have a partner that, um, he, Definitely makes life worth living. <laughs> um, I know that's cheesy, but <laughs> it's true. And um, I just hope that everyone else who like, feels this way, um, questioning their gender or their sexual orientation or anything, can feel that as well. Um, so we're going to open it up for questions. So uh, we're. Um, if you identify as a man and you're also gay, does that mean you like guys or you like girls? You like guys. Or, no. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You know, do you like guys instead of girls since you identify as a guy and, and you also. I like identify as panoramic. Oh. But, but if, if you're transgender, like say you're a woman trans. Uh, transitioning into a man, and you like men, then you would be identified as gay. And if you are a trans man who is interested in women, you would be identified as straight. And uh, so your your um, your gender identity is is not related to your um, romantic attraction. It's two separate things. Yeah, like it doesn't like you can be go back to the go back to the diagram there. Yeah. Ah. Right? <laughs> gender identity versus sexual and romantic attraction. They that's are why, That's why they're on things. different sides of the page. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I remember my question. I, but I don't really know how to pose this question because, like, I feel like it would, it would make me look bad as sort of, like, giving someone, like, their, a label or identifying them. But you feel like some people may abuse this revolution of, like, heading away from heteronormative that like kind of idea of what I'm saying like people who don't identify a certain thing but doing that because they see it as trendy or things oh, so you're yeah. saying because yeah. it's cool you're gay. Yeah, so the whole, like, uh, like a lot of people will say, like, oh, you're just going through, a, through a, um, a phase, and that is the case for some people. For some people, it is a phase, and other people, like, bandwagon on it for attention and whatever, but for the most part, uh, so after... they're not, yeah. basically. And, and time will tell. Eventually, it, it, like, if they stop exhibiting any such behaviors, then, like, the, then they probably aren't or whatever. Then it could have been a phase, but treat it as though it's not, because it very well might not be. That and gender identity and sexual orientation are very fluid, both. Yeah. They can change whenever. You don't have to be set. You can be like 50-something and be like, oh, I feel different. But <laughs> there is so, that one every once in a while who is like, hey, this is cool. So. And, and let, let's, you know, let's sort of take some facts from, a, from another place, which is, the two populations in school that get bullied the most are other abled students and LGBT students get bullied the most. So you're going to pretend to be gay and yeah. go to school and tell everybody at school that you're a guy who likes guys and you're going to deal with the fallout of that. So that idea is, it really is, assume if somebody is actually stepping up to present that way that that's true for them because they're paying a price frequently to own themselves and to be real both on the inside and the outside. Um, I'm asexual, so when you guys started talking about phases of like, when you make that exception from your sexuality, 
And that all stems back to, like, stemming from his question, all and all that just happened back to the chart. It's all, they're all separate things that are not necessarily related. They can be, but not necessarily. They're some all people fluid. Just like, yeah. Some people are just like, hey, I like masculine clothes on other people, so I'm attracted to this, even though they're a woman. So. <laughs> 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 That's the true goal. It all depends on you, yourself. Like, even though you might identify as bisexual, you might find girls more appealing 60% of the time and guys more appealing 40%. You're still bisexual. 50-50, still bisexual. 70-30, still bisexual. It all depends on you and how, <laughs> how, how it relates to you. Every, everyone is specific. Everybody has their own life path. Uh, so, yeah. We have time for one more question. Well, does anyone else want to ask you that ask like several questions? So, I have an aunt, and like ever since I was like born, she's kind of like one of my best friends, and I've always known that she didn't identify as a straight woman, but she always did it as such. Until recently, she's like she's been living a lot. She hasn't come out to anyone, but it's obvious in the part that she's living. When she comes around, but I've never actually stated like I support you and I'm okay with everything that they that you are. But should I should I do that? Because I just feel like I just really like touching you. It's whatever to me, like it's just normal in my mind. Like, I don't see anything different or odd about it. So I just, you know, when she's talking about her partner and stuff like that, I'm like, okay, cool. And I'm listening to the stories and I interact and I engage. But should I, like, explicitly state, I love you for who you are. I hope that, you know, as you continue on your journey and discover who you are as a person, that, like, you are, you're happy and you're supported and all that stuff. Like, should I state that or should I, you know, continue what it is that I've already been doing, which is just. I think, I think either way, honestly, because, like, I don't think anyone would really, like, dislike to hear that. Yeah. But know. the thing is, some people, if you are gay and you are closeted, to be told that is, like, ah. Yeah, because, yeah, the, um, so, I mean, for some people, yeah, like, um, like, you don't, you don't always want to, like, like, want it to be, like, a big deal. Like, I mean, yeah, I'm pansexual, but, like, it doesn't really affect anything I do outside of my relationships. So, I mean, I guess it depends on the person and the relationship you have with them. So, I guess that would be a judgment you'd have to make. But I guess it is good to hear things like, I accept you. Yeah. I love you no matter what. In, in this case, I feel it would be more appropriate to actually sit her down and tell her that than somebody you don't know as well. Mm -hmm. And you, you'd find her as your best friend. Mm -hmm. So, I think anybody's best friend would love hearing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, agree. I agree. I think. So, I think in this situation, it would be good. So, we've got to wrap it up so Paul can finish up with. The, your um, act stuff and your your um, goal planning, etc. But um, you can find Inside Out on uh, YouTube. You can find us on the web at insideoutys.org. We've got some pamphlets up here. We're open Monday, Wednesday, Friday, starting at 3:30 for drop-in and activities until 7 or 7:30 Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We're at 412 South Tayholm Street, so right downtown. So those of you that want to know, the bus station, we'd love to have any of you come and uh, visit and uh, maybe come hang out. Yes. Yeah. Right. Thank you all. All right, all right everyone, you've got um, feedback forms in front of you. Please start filling those out.